Okay. That's on. Everyone can hear me okay? Okay. Uh, thanks for all coming out and uh, allowing me the opportunity to uh, present at your uh, neurosurgical brain rounds today. Uh, I really appreciate being here. Uh, so just to get started, no disclosures um, and for the CME type stuff. Uh, the objective, we're going to review the historical classification of uh, diffuse gliomas in adults. Uh, provide an updated uh, 2016 uh, WHO uh, way of thinking about uh, integrated diagnoses of diffuse gliomas, and then uh, discuss how chromosomal and uh, gene level copy amplification can enhance our current understanding and classification system. So just the outline, uh, a brief introduction uh, to adult brain tumor classification and the history, the current World Health Organization classification of diffuse gliomas, uh, what I've, and then uh, transition to what I've been working with Eric Collin in the Department of uh, Neurosurgery and uh, at the Fred Hutch, uh, talking, uh, looking at uh, visualization of uh, molecular data, big data sets, and how we can use TCGA data sets and things like that to leverage understanding and uh, refinement of classification of diffuse gliomas uh, up beyond what the WHO already recommends. I'm going to go into uh, a little bit of how we took that platform and defined novel copy number alteration molecular subtypes and the uh, clinical implications for those. And then uh, uh, additionally, some examples of uh, molecular risk stratification. So uh, as I think most people know that um, the way that we've defined and classified diffuse gliomas uh, up until 2016 hadn't changed much over the past 100 years really starting with uh, Cushing and Bailey in the 1920s. Um, this was really the first organized attempt to look at uh, histology under the microscope of different type of brain tumors and classify them based on the putative uh, cell of origin histogenesis. And uh, they, they still use, uh, I mean, terms that we understand today, just kind of breaking it down, like glioblastoma, uh, neuroblastoma, oligodendroglioma, pendymoma, is kind of the basic framework of what we understand and how we uh, do things now. And over the years, the histological grading schemes um, have changed a little bit. Uh, there's the Ringer's classification, the St. Anne uh, Mayo classification system, uh, which is sort of the basis of what we do now. And then the World Health Organization, whose first edition came out in the late 1970s, and uh, has been pretty much similar uh, up through 2007 uh, and until the 2016 where, uh, edition where it changed. And this is basically what, how we classify it according to the World Health Organization. So if you look at the histology of, um, just gonna focus on diffuse gliomas as the main category of uh, adult brain tumors that we, we tend to focus on and we see a lot of and it's got the highest morbidity for uh, adult patients. So how, kind of the framework of how we thought about this histologically is oligodendrogliomas closely look like oligodendrocytes, right? You see um, round regular nuclei, they're small. Um, this doesn't have the classic fried egg appearance or uh, chicken wire vasculature that you might see, but it's a good example of um, uh, nuclear morphology of an oligodendroglioma. Then astrocytic tumors are a little more uh, elongated, irregular <coughs> chromatin, and uh, just a little, I guess you would say, uglier looking. And then up, up until recently, we had this uh, kind of wastebasket terminology of uh, what's either called a mixed glioma, ambiguous glioma, or oligoastrocytoma. And uh, it used to be that uh, QA conferences around the place would be it, people arguing what you call what you call a tumor, right? Is it a mixed oligo, is it astro, is it a all, all straight oligo? And uh, there's been a uh, published data set showing that there's uh, even been, uh, even with established and very experienced neuropathologists, there's a lot of intra and inner observer variability in the ability to classify. So the grading, how, the grading uh, is an attempt to basically say how bad these tumors will act, and what the um, what the prognosis will be. So if we if we break it down just into oligodendrogliomas, 
or astrocytomas, right? We start with grading. So grade two is uh, the lowest grade, the best prognosis according to this classification scheme. <coughs> and the difference between a grade two and a grade three is uh, basically defined as mitotic activity. So analogous dendrogliomas, it's very well defined, uh, uh, six mitosis per 10 high power field. And astrocytomas, it is um, a great area and something that we struggle with uh, still about what to call a grade two versus a grade three anaplastic astrocytoma. And um, uh, again, a lot of inter-observer variability, and this is uh, some place where the uh, WHO right now falls short in being able to guide and uh, predict prognosis. And then for higher grade, if it's astrocytoma, you see necrosis, it's a glioblastoma. Uh, nomenclature is a little weird. We go from astrocytoma to glioblastoma uh, based on the, the grade four status, but all of the dendroglioma stay the same. And microvascular proliferation. Again, if it's a all of the dendroglioma, it's a grade three. And if it's astrocytoma, it's a, a grade four. And then, I guess a little more recently, over the last 20-ish years or so, we've uh, started to gain an understanding of uh, not only the histology, but molecular uh, markers that will be good in uh, predicting prognosis of these uh, types of tumors. And one of the first one that's been robust, reproducible, and all that is the, the loss of whole chromosome arms 1P and 19Q. And, uh, the co-deletion that occurs with them. So originally it was shown that for the diffuse astrocytomas, diffuse uh, oligodendrogliomas, that if it had 1P19Q, you had a better prognosis overall. And for oligodendrogliomas, at least in the anaplastic oligos, where a lot of the clinical trials were, that it really predicted a response to uh, uh, chemotherapy, chemoradiation. <coughs> And then more recently, although still 10 years ago, there was um, was really, uh, I think what most of us know now is uh, isocitrate dehydrogenase or IDH mutations came to be known in diffuse gliomas. The first study uh, here in science that uh, they did uh, some DNA sequencing of a large panel of glioblastomas and found that approximately 5% of them had mutations in the IDH either IDH1 or IDH2 uh, genes. And that, even though it's a small number, it really stratified uh, uh, risk, uh, uh, the probability of overall survival, like where the IDH mutation uh, tumors are being much better than the IDH wild type tumors. And uh, shortly thereafter, uh, uh, the group, mostly Duke and uh, others, uh, had looked at IDH mutational status in the lower grade, the grade two, grade three diffuse gliomas and showed that about 80, 85% of these tumors, unlike the 5% that you see in glioblastomas, have a IDH mutation. And this actually really split the uh, prognosis right, with IDH mutational status being much better than IDH wild type status. And that does better than grade uh, by itself. So we started to get this molecular understanding of uh, prognosis and risk stratification. Then, uh, Shortly after that, uh, there was other molecular attempts to categorize uh, gliomas and uh, <coughs> possible uh, molecular markers of uh, aggressiveness. Uh, one of the first ones described was by Verhoek, looking at transcriptional subtypes of uh, glioblastomas, and originally defined as four uh, classifications. We can scratch this neural one because that's been shown to uh, not really hold up, and it was due to sampling issues. But uh, the three major types that are non-IDH mutated are proneural, classical, and mesenchymal. Uh, where the proneural is often associated with PDGF signaling, mesenchymal is often associated with P53 and NF1 mutations, and the classical is often uh, thought of as uh, uh, EGFR-driven tumors. And uh, I'll show it a little bit later. While uh, biologically relevant, these don't really risk stratify or predict prognosis uh, on their own. Uh, there's also been attempts at looking at uh, whole genome methylation uh, status. So this is one of the first ones by the group out of Heidelberg who now does basically methylation profiling on every tumor type. But when they were looking at uh, glioblastomas originally, they had come up with uh, something similar and 
quite reproducible. Looking at um, uh, when you do unsupervised hierarchical clustering, you get IDH mutational status, then you get these uh, uh, histone mutations, either H3K27M or H3K34R, and then what they call uh, receptor tyrosine kinase subgroups, either PDGFR or the classic, which is more uh, uh, EGF driven, or the mesenchymal. And they uh, really kind of overlap with each other. So uh, RTK1 goes to chronoromosanchymal, mesenchymal, RTK2 classical. But as you can see here, while they are biologically relevant and have been shown to have uh, different implications um, in that way, they don't really pre uh, predict prognosis. And uh, they don't really help you risk gratifying and see who, who might be better, who might be worse. So uh, when we go back and we think about the um, kind of the big whole whole scale uh, genome studies, um, TCGA, the Cancer Genome Analyst, comes to uh, mind. <coughs> Excuse me. And really, uh, what they found uh, again, uh, looking at this, that the risk stratification. So if you just go prior to the uh, originally defined histological classes, astrocytoma, oligo, uh, mixed oligo, or oligo, that it's really hard to tell who's going to do better than uh, the other. <coughs> but if you take IDH mutational status and 1P19Q co-deletion, you basically split it uh, with IDH, or lower grade uh, tumors being IDH mutant, and then uh, all IDH wild type and even the lower grade, grade two, grade three, IDH wild type doing worse than the glioblastoma that are IDH mutant. <clears throat> so this seemed to be a better predictor than, than grade. So uh, in, the, in 2016, uh, the WHO came out with their uh, revised classification system. And this was um, uh, really nice in the fact that it was the first solid tumor system to integrate both histological classification of molecular markers in order to uh, provide integrated diagnoses. So the integrated diagnosis that we refer to uh, includes um, histology with molecular status. And if you've seen our reports, that's kind of how we've organized our reports. <coughs> and an integrated um, diagnosis is our top line. So there's a lot of entities in the WHO, um, and we're just really gonna focus on the uh, diffuse clean <coughs> Uh, category. And it's shown here, um, right, the astrocytomas are now defined by either IDH mutant or IDH wild type status. Same with the uh, glioblastomas and the oligodendrogliomas. Since this new definition, they are defined as uh, 1P19Q <laughs> and IDH mutant. Now there's no longer this uh, oligodendroglioma uh, with, without 1P19Q co-deletion or astrocytomas with, with 1P19Q co-deletion, um, right? Because the, the molecular markers are much better predictor than the histology. And then this, they've kind of got rid of this uh, wastebasket term of oligo astrocytoma because uh, it's been shown that if you call something oligo or astro, oligo astro and you do the molecular profiling, it can be resolved into one of the other two categories, either astrocytoma or oligodendrogenoma. So uh, just a little uh, algorithm of how we uh, diagnose these now makes it really simple and less arguing at our neuropath QA conferences, which is really nice. So um, I think the first line is important that we start off with histology. First, you have to get it to diffuse gloom. So I, uh, to, to the minority of people who think that uh, pathologists in the microscope are going to be replaced by molecular um, studies. Uh, I think our microscope is here to stay at the foundation of what we do, but we do really integrate molecular status into what we do. So uh, the next line is looking at IDH mutational status. You either have IDH mutant or IDH wild type, either in the lower grade or the higher grade. And if it's a glioblastoma, you're done. Uh, it's glioblastoma IDH mutant versus IDH wild type. If it's IDH wild type lower grade glioma, then right, if you, you have to make sure it's not, not like a DNET or a ganglion glioma or anything like that. And, but you do get to this uh, either diffuse astrocytoma, IDH wild type, 
um, or um, anaplastic astrocyte. And then for the IDH mutant, that's where we split off with 1p19q codeletion, defining all the dendritic gliomas, and uh, not a diagnostic utility, but usually characteristic of astrocytomas that are IDH mutant. You have loss of ATRX, AMC53 mutations, which gives you the diffuse um, astrocytoma IDH mutation. <clears throat> okay, so that's kind of the history and where our current understanding and how we currently classify these tumors are right now. So uh, just want to <clears throat> break a little bit and talk about when the 2016 WHO came out. It was about the same time that uh, uh, Eric Holland at the Hutch and Tony Boleri worked together to uh, ask the question like, how can we take these big data of uh, big data molecular sets and visualize them in a way that we could easily look at these and understand some biology. Uh, and then, uh, so they published this in PNAS and they took, it was just basically uh, the TCGA data set and they showed that uh, if you take copy number, if you take copy number based on SNP arrays and just uh, thresholds along with whole exome sequencing and uh, gene variants that you can use uh, what's called multi-dimensional scaling analysis. It's a um, type of um, reduction analysis. It's similar to PCA, except that you don't have actual axes. And the closer the dots are together, the more genetically related they are. And the further apart uh, they are from one another, the uh, less similar they are. And each uh, data point represents multi-dimensional uh, point of one of one tumor profile <clears throat> and then uh, did the same thing with uh, methylation status and show that you could you basically get two types of uh, methylation uh, categories one was what historically was called uh, G semper glioma CPG island methylator phenotype and those were really the great mostly the grade two grade three tumors and what was the called the non semper the non CPG phenotype, which is largely glioblastomas. And similar to the TCGA uh, New England Journal uh, article and those, that if you if you just take a line here and split it, you get a, a nice uh, partitioning of the, the survival characteristics for the, uh, for the based on uh, SIMP status. Hey, PJ, can I just ask a question two slides back, which was, what do you do with the small number of oligos that are co-deleted but an IDH1 wild type. So, uh, so there. So those uh, are thought not to exist. <laughs> right. So, um, right. So, uh, right now, if you are very convinced it's an oligodendroglioma and you think that the molecular does not match the histology, there are. Um, you can. It's kind of discouraged. We don't have a lot of these. You can get. Um, Have you ever had one of those? Not since we've been doing this in the last couple of years. Okay. And uh, so you can get it. It's it's not the preferred way to do this, but there's this category called not otherwise specified. And if things don't quite match up, um, <laughs> you do that. So there are glioblastomas probably. So there are a known set of glioblastomas that have 1p19q codeletion, not IDH mutant that are detected by fish. And that's usually just because you lose so many uh, copy numbers of the chromosomes anyway. By random selection, you're going to find something that's 1p19q codeletion. But if you go back and you do uh, kind of a more granular way to look at these, like SNP array or CGH or whatever, and you look at the whole, zone, whole arm chromosome loss, those aren't lost. You only, it, because the probes are mostly at the end of the chromosomes, so you're losing like the end of these. So fish can, uh, the fish technique will give you false positives, and it's something that we're aware of. So we've had a case that's been the opposite, where it's uh, it's looked like an astrocytoma, uh, high p53 on immunized chemistry loss of ATRX, and it had 1p19q co-deletion on fish. And so, what do you do with those cases? Um, uh, the recommendation I think from our group was to look at the whole chromosome arms of these because. Uh, it's probably likely a false positive on fish. Um, I don't remember whatever happened to that case, but they're, they're rare. And as far as the grade two, grade threes, uh, 
things that classically look like oligo and by sequencing our IDH wild type and 1P19 cubic code deleted, we don't we have those. Um, do you remember any of those? It's been a while, but I've had a couple. That, uh, that are IDH from wild type and code deleted. With, so, I mean, I can't remember. Right. But so maybe we'll talk offline because there are ways of uh, detecting IDH mutations. <laughs> Like if you do immunohistochemistry, um, depending where that's done, right, it, to call that negative or a wild type is wrong. And there's some people in town that do that. And um, you just have to be careful, just understand the, the strategies of how, how we're defining these. But I think if you if you do like the DNA sequencing followed by like real chromosomal uh, uh, mapping, that those don't exist. And if they do, then you would probably put it under one of these not otherwise specified categories. So I think it's just usually an artifact for the analysis? I, I think so. I think fish, uh, if, especially uh, here in most places where they do the fluorescence and saturation of the fish, you can get some the false readings of that. So if you're, if you're molecular, right, that's another good thing that, to bring up. If your molecular histology don't really line up, or your, even your molecular doesn't align with itself, there's probably something going on in the analysis and will take deeper way to interrogate that. Okay, so um, after uh, Eric and me had uh, gone on to, to find these, uh, these MDS classifications or this MDS uh, way of visualizing big data sets, they, uh, they put it into an online freely available tool, what's called Oncoscape, and this will be the little plug for it. It's what uh, gave me kind of the basis of uh, a lot of the discovery work that I'm going to be talking about. And if you haven't used it, something worth checking out. <coughs> is not, if there's any people non-neuro-based, it contains all the TCGA data sets, so you can look at any tumor uh, that has TCGA data available. And now they've uh, released this uh, version 3 or V3 where you can upload your own data into it and do, uh, there's a lot of uh, visual, visualization and uh, dimensionality tools that you can use, it's uh, quite cool. So uh, ha after they had published this, I, I asked, okay, so what does this mean to us kind of clinically and how can we use it, how can we integrate with uh, what the WHO says with uh, with this visualization technique. Is there anything that we can do to confirm the, what the WHO is showing? And then beyond that, can we pull anything out of the data? So uh, the, just the first panel is showing, again, it's kind of a, a reproduction of the plot that uh, Hamid had uh, put up. Again, three of these uh, major clusters in here. You can see this one right lower left, right upper left, and then this left. And then uh, if you map on what was the original like 2007 histological diagnoses on these, this cluster here is basically what was called either oligodendroglioma or a mixed oligoastrocytoma. This group over here was mostly glioblastoma, but there's a few uh, other lower grade tumors mixed in. And then this uh, one up in the top right is kind of a hodgepodge of uh, mixing. And so what I think it really shows like the, the heterogeneity within this shows how either, at least based on if you define these molecularly, that the histology doesn't necessarily predict the molecular uh, outcome, molecular structure. If you go on to uh, look at the grades as well, so most of your grade fours, again, they're glioblastoma, so these are the left uh, cluster, and then most, all grade two, grade threes are in here, and then again, this is a mixture with grade two, grade three, and just a little less grade four. It's just a different way to visualize it. So we got basically the histology of, uh, of these, and the next idea was, okay, the WHO incorporated 1P19Q co-deletion ID status, P53 ATRs, how does that look like in our clusters? And if you do these, uh, these mapping, uh, looking at either IDH1 mutation or IDH2 mutations, you can see the split here, that these are IDH tumors, which basically, this is really the most common thing to have in order. So IDH is the, the biggest splitter uh, of these. P53 mutations, mostly uh, in, in this uh, cluster, with uh, some in this upper cluster and very few down here. 
ATRX, uh, similar profile. And then 1P19Q code deletion was all down here. Right, so we've got IDH mutation. Sorry. IDH mutation, 1P19Q code deletion, IDH mutation, IDH wild. So if we just take what was the 2007 classification scheme, and we look at the what was diagnosed in each cluster, you get a whole lot of diagnoses here, a whole lot of diagnoses here, a whole lot of diagnoses here. Not very helpful. But we take it based on the 2016 classification, we've come up with uh, three major subgroups of what they, what they had defined independently. So this is basically either astrocytoma, grade two, grade four, right, glue blastoma, IDH wild type, up here is IDH mutant astrocytoma or IDH mutant uh, glioblastoma. And down here is your uh, IDH mutant uh, M1P19Q code deleted. Uh, all of the dendrogliomas. So if we uh, then want to define the demographics of these clusters, and similar to the New England Journal uh, article, we're just confirming what they, they show, at least on this side. If you break it up based on the 2007 histology, you get a terrible uh, stratification or prognosis. But our, uh, if you look at the clusters that uh, we define in <coughs> outgrade, you get a, a nice oligodendroglioma, astrocytoma, IDH mutant, and then your glioblastoma is IDH wild type. And to look at the age distribution in these, again, what we kind of know is that uh, IDH wild type is. Uh, Closer to uh, the age 60 and older is what happens. And then IDH mutant astrocytomas are typically younger than the 20s uh, and 30s. And then uh, what hadn't been really described before, uh, at least in the context of looking at oligodendroglioma 1P19 Q coach deletion and uh, IDH mutation, you kind of get this bimodal age distribution here of. Uh, people in their uh, late 30s to uh, people in their mid 50s. Kind of not clear why that happens or, or what that really means. But if we take the median age, which was age 40 of these, and just split it up, you can get, a, a independent of grade, you can get a, a risk stratification. Sorry, it was age 45. So age 45 seemed to be a, a big uh, risk stratifier, at least for the holiday. Similar to grade, and then when you when you uh, overlap them, they look quite similar. So either a grade three and a plastic, or uh, grade or age of forty five or older, tends to predict poor prognosis in uh, all of those. Okay, then um, so as I said before, these were originally defined in the MDS um, uh, visualization uh, of based upon the integrated uh, exome sequencing variants along with copy number alterations. So I just want to look at the copy number profiling across these, these tumors, because we already got the IDH and um, P53 and 1P19 population, those things seem to stratify. So again, if we, if, we do one P, uh, if we look at this bottom cluster, what we said was really it's defined on copy number basis by 1P19Q code deletion. This uh, kind of heterogeneous uh, cluster up here doesn't really seem to have a copy number signature, and the, the heterogeneity of the copy number seem to reflect the um, heterogeneity of the histopathology. Looking at what was the IDH wild type, it's really uh, what we've kind of known, uh, defined by gain of chromosome 7 and loss of chromosome 10. Uh, with some other things right, like uh, 9P loss or CDKN2A loss, but um, really gain of 7 loss of 10. And this can be actually further stratified, so if you take these, this cluster and there's a way to now uh, rotate it in three dimensions, you can see that these actually resolve into three separate clusters. And if we define those three clusters and do the copy number alterations, then, then right, so A, a subgroup is basically defined by a gain of chromosome 1 uh, or p53 mutation and then B and C are really close with each other but they're really split just based on 19 Q or gain of whole chromosome 19 uh, in, in this group and then we wanted to see well 
does this have any prognostic significance? And so kind of the evolution of how we, we uh, looked at this was just take the clusters and basically the one with uh, 19 Q gain essentially was the best actor, this black one. The one with relatively little uh, copy number alterations other than 710 were the worst actors. And then the one on top was this red one that we split. Or that was in the middle. And um, if we look at CDK4 and MDM2 amplification, which showed up on those copy number plots, we can refine each of these, uh, these clusters. And I'll just kind of you can just kind of go over that. But basically, what we can do, if we take copy number alteration, define these molecular subtypes after we, we pulled the kind of the information off this Onquascape or this MDS data, with basically six uh, molecular signatures, um, looking at chromosome one, chromosome 19, CDK4, and MDM2 amplification, or uh, P16 uh, homozygous deletion, we can come up with that algorithm to look at either wild type glioblastomas, um, lower grade uh, IDH wild type tumors, or IDH mutant uh, gliomas, and it seems grade doesn't matter in, in these, and then all the dendrogliomas, and we map this across, you do get a nice risk stratification based upon these copy numbers um, derived from MDS classification, where this is the worst actor, these are the best actor, and you can see the uh, median survival uh, increases as you go from left to right. So really kind of uh, the first evidence beyond IDH that uh, molecular status can help to uh, risk stratify these patients and an idea that um, helps to support the idea that, that diffuse gliomas should uh, at least partially have a molecular grade rather than a histology grade uh, alone. <coughs> and these uh, molecular uh, copy number subtypes are independent of WHO grade. Um, kind of skip over this for now. But so the, originally it was defined in the TCGA data set and we, went, we wanted to validate this in a, a orthogonal way. So we looked at what a large data set where there is copy number uh, data available and we, we were able to collaborate with uh, people out of uh, Germany, uh, Heidelberg and Switzerland and uh, get access to uh, over 250 profile tumors in the German glioma network. And when we do this, uh, and it's different platforms too, so we're looking across, not only across uh, populations, but we're looking across molecular platforms that the, uh, these subtypes seem to hold up uh, across. And then if you do a linear regression, again, it's nearly a one-to-one -one correlation, uh, kind of validating the prognosis of what we, uh, what we see, with, at least in the discovery of the TCG data So we've got these copy number out alterations, and um, at least in these large two data sets, they can uh, at least seems to reproducibly uh, predict prognosis. So uh, what are some other additional considerations that we have for uh, these copy number subtypes? Uh, how do copy number subtypes distribute across clinical trial cohorts? And is there a need to inform clinical trials based upon the, uh, the copy number status? Um, uh, I'm gonna show you some data here that says yes, we should, and uh, I'll go more into detail on that. Then we want to know eventually, are these subtypes predictive of, of therapeutic response? And to initially address this, I'm working on developing mouse models of these copy number subtypes, and I'm not going to go into that mouse stuff here. It's too early in the morning to talk about that. And then um, looking kind of uh, at our sources locally, uh, what, what does it mean for the University of Washington Seattle cohort? And what, what can we do um, to better understand our patient population with this? And does it hold up to our patient population? And initially, uh, I'm focusing on grade two, grade three uh, diffuse gliomas. As the uh, GGN data set was grade four, even though validated, we haven't done it in the lower grade. And uh, I'm doing some profiling of a, a, a large cohort of uh, UW uh, patients here. Happy to talk about that uh, offline if anybody has any questions. So, uh, going back to this idea of the should copy number, uh, our, our defined copy number of uh, subtypes uh, inform clinical trials. If you go back to kind of what we showed, right, with uh, 
IDH mutational status, chromosome 1, CDK4 and DM2 amplification chromosome 19, you can get these three IDH wild type glioblastoma um, subtypes that seem to stratify beyond what the WHO would predict, uh, and just calling them uh, IDH wild type glioblastomas. And this is just the TCGA uh, the cohort again, showing that these are basically the worst actors in the middle of the road and the best actors with uh, the median survival being nearly a year between the, the, the uh, ends. So uh, we took the TCGA data and German glioma data and then uh, two small cohorts to look at the distribution of profiling across these cohorts. One was an uh, ART trial that looked at uh, uh, a vaccinated response in the elderly and it was uh, a prospective clinical uh, phase two trial uh, based in Switzerland. And um, the other one was uh, kind of this mix of um, prospective, retrospective uh, data sets that was uh, originally published by Raoul Rabadon at Columbia University who gathered multi-institutional uh, um, data sets where instead of clinical trials, the um, kind of the inclusion criteria was you're looking at initial and recurrence. So this is neurosurgical based. So the patients had to do well enough to be deemed uh, well enough to have a, 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 re a resection at uh, first recurrence. And when you look at these, you do get a shift in these uh, smaller clinical trial or uh, prospective um, uh, intervention-based uh, cohorts with a higher shift towards the better acting copy number subtype, showing that we kind of, uh, at least what we're doing uh, by selecting patients either for clinical trial or ones who do good enough uh, for a better being resection, uh, resectable at first recurrence by neurosurgeons, that uh, we do have a, a, a bias in molecular profiling for these. And something to be aware of, because this may, this may be unevenly distributed in certain arms if you're not aware of the molecular profiling when you go and put, uh, look at patients that uh, you may get a, a skew in your data because of that. And then uh, also, you may think of uh, phase one, phase two trials where the, the um, data is not applicable because you're mostly looking at people who do better and uh, you're not really including the, the worst actors when you're trying to take this to phase three in general on um, population trial. So um, looking at the... Uh, Looking at this, we, we, we believe that there is a need to inform clinical trials. And then we want to get back to uh, what are molecular predictors of bad um, uh, aggressiveness. And um, wanted to focus on this paired initial uh, recurrence tumors, right? Because uh, I think it's a little more applicable to neurosurgical audience. And so what, this data set also had a whole exome sequencing uh, available to it. And so we're able to take the, this Columbia, uh, Columbia multi-institutional data set and map it back onto the TCGA data set. And just for validation, we can show that it has the same mutational signature as what we, what we know the uh, TCGA data set to be. And when you look at this, so over here it, uh, to the left, the gray is the TCGA reference data set, the blue and the red are uh, initial and uh, recurrent tumors. And if you take green edges to, uh, to connect the dots on these, you can see that there's some shift in, in, in this data set on this MDS map, but largely you're missing this population right here. And that is believed to where the patients are doing poorly. They're poor uh, gliomas where surgeons across the US and Asia deem them unresectable. And, uh, and for that reason, uh, we, we're defining that as a poor, poor prognostic subgroup. Uh, what beyond multidimensional scaling predicts these? We're not, um, we're not quite sure yet. That's something we're exploring further. But it'd be nice to know if we have a molecular correlate, to radiographical, clinical information, anything like that. So that's going to take some, uh, uh, some work for us to define what that is. Uh, and this just shows. Uh, that you cannot predict the groups based on gene expression <coughs> or uh, methylation <coughs> profile. Let me just kind of skip that there. Okay, so that was the at least the early work that we have um, looking at IDH wild type 
gliomas and the implication for uh, clinical, I guess, uh, for either clinical prognosis or clinical trials. And that just came out online on uh, PubMed yesterday, so if you are interested more, uh, you can look that up or I'm happy to talk about it later, you know, off offline. So then we want to move to the, uh, what about the IDH mutations, uh, gliomas? So right now, histologic grading of uh, IDH mutant astrocytomas is poor. Uh, our uh, understanding of histologic determinants of aggressiveness is bad. The histology, or grade two versus grade three, as I mentioned in one of the first slides, is not very predictive of aggressiveness. But we have some converging evidence that uh, demonstrates there's the utility of molecular grading of IDH mutation, mutant gliomas, and largely um, based upon uh, copy number profiling. So this is a, a slide I stole from Dan Bratt, who spoke at our uh, National Neuropath meeting uh, last month, um, and just kind of put our, our work into context with uh, another uh, uh, study um, out of Japan, and uh, showing that there's some overlapping. If, so we're going back to this, what was um, those prognostic groups, the IDH mutant astrocytomas, and we define bad actors as uh, CDK4 amplified or CDKN2A co-deletion or the homozygous deletion or chromosome 14 loss. This group had something similar where they overlapped and they had CDKN2A deletion, CDK4 amplification as uh, poor prognostic markers. So there's some overlap in uh, what, what's going on. And then more recently, a uh, group out of Heidelberg who had done a lot of this um, methylation profiling had uh, just released this, uh, what, what they proposed um, to be an improved grading system for IDH mutant astrocytomas, which um, I, I think it's really nice, and uh, I'll, I'll kind of go over the details, but it, it might be uh, a limited way to do these because copy number profiling is not uh, available everywhere. It's kind of expensive and requires uh, a lot of technical support. So I don't know how, how, how much uh, this will actually get into how we practice. But when they looked at independent markers of, uh, uh, of <coughs> based on copy number, again, uh, theirs didn't really find, in their cohort, their discovery cohort, they did not find that CDK4 amplification in a univariate way predicts uh, prognosis, but the CDKN2A P16 loss does. So I guess out of these three so far, that um, the CDKN2A homozygous deletion is really kind of a molecular marker of really poor prognosis, and that seems to hold up against across the, the, these three studies that have been published. So what they had uh, also proposed is that you can take histology, basically necrosis is their histologic uh, correlate of aggressiveness, CDKN2A B loss, and then uh, total copy number variation load. And this might be the, the rate limiting step which would get this thing like widely adopted by practicing neuropathologists because this is, you, you really need a platform to do this and it's, it's <coughs> technically a little more difficult and uh, cost uh, prohibitive in some areas. So they basically have shown that these homozygous deletions necrosis, copy number, variation, either low or high will the, uh, predict prognosis. So um, that, that's where it stands, and that just came out similarly. Uh, that just came out recently. Um, another thing that this group had done, done I'm just kind of going on a, on a side for uh, a second because people might hear about it, um, it was recently published in Nature, was looking at uh, methylation platform which they used for this uh, to determine copy number. <coughs> and then uh, looking at methylation signatures, you can, um, might be a useful adjunct for differential diagnosis. Won't give you prognosis or tell you much about diffuse gliomas themselves, but can help you differentiate diffuse gliomas from other categories. And this is kind of a hot topic now, so I thought I'd put a couple of slides of, uh, about it. So. Uh, the Stefan Fister and uh, Andres von Weinling uh, had put together this thing. It, this is also a um, freely available resource uh, funded by the um, DKFZ, uh, German Cancer uh, Consortium. 
And what they did was they had a large data set doing methylation profiling of over 2,000 tumors, which is really incredible. And took the histology, molecular map, and did something, uh, looked at TSNE plots, which is not quite MDS, but it's a different way to visualize data. And shown that you can really split uh, molecular subtypes and histological subtypes. Um, uh, and they all have their uh, unique profile. So in difficult to diagnose cases, uh, I know that uh, some other institutions have been doing this as an adjunct way to help figure out uh, differential diagnoses, right? Is it a tissue? Is it a pneumoma? Is it an uh, astrocytoma? Is it something like that where uh, we would really benefit on knowing uh, or helping refine the classification? And then uh, you can take your data, upload it into their, um, upload it into their system, which is uh, fast and free. And uh, I've done this a couple of times; it's really nice. And you get, um, you can get just based on methylation uh, arrays. You can ID status, you can get classifier, you get copy number profile, and you can get MGMT promoter status. So it's really kind of a, um, a bunch of tests all in one platform. Uh, it's something I, I, I would hope to see uh, locally that we could do, right? Because you would you could eliminate the need for IDH sequencing. You can eliminate the need, or at least some of the need for fish, and you can eliminate the need for MGMT send out in a faster turnaround time than what we do normally send it out now to North Carolina and take like a month to get back. So we already uh, discussed that. Okay. So as we're nearing the end, uh, just some basic take-home points of uh, kind of how uh, diffuse glioma classification uh, has uh, evolved and what it means, right? So the largest predictor to diffuse glioma survival <coughs> is IDH mutational status. Um, IDH itself um, does a lot of, or has a lot of roles in the cell and uh, including metabolism, uh, it's thought to uh, inhibit differentiation. It uh, alters the chromosomes, chromosomal uh, architecture and uh, um, chromatin, excuse me, chromatin uh, status of the, uh, the uh, structure of DNA. Right? So a lot of things that IDH does. And diffuse gliomas, it is a copy, uh, disease of copy number. And the uh, gene level amplification we talked about, CDK4, uh, MDM2, CDKN2A, are really main cell cycle genes. And so it seems like a lot of this copy number is driving cell cycle. Uh, and, employee, and there's some data uh, from us and others that show that um, aneuploidy itself, right, gains a whole chromosome or large chunks of chromosomes are, are drive cell cycle or have um, some uh, cell cycle. Uh, DNA structure uh, itself, so what we're looking at in the MDS, it improve, uh, provides improved, improved prognostic utility over what was done with the Verhoek and the, uh, the uh, Heidelberg methylation. Um, although, as we showed last, methylation is good for differential diagnosis. It does not really help predict itself, predict um, prognosis in these patients. And diffuse gliomas are caused by signal transduction, right? We talked about the RTKs, the EGFR, PDGF, right? These are RAS, uh, RAF driven, MEGERG, AKT, all that, that path, pathways. So that seems to be the early event associated with aneuploidy and, um, and initiation of gliomas in some glioma maintenance, but the aggressiveness itself is driven by cell cycle aberrations. So there seems to be Right, uh, a baseline of uh, receptor tyrosine kinase um, <coughs> signaling, which is further driven uh, by cell cycle aberrations. Um, and might those be something that we can uh, look at further for targeting? So, in summary, uh, current WHO classification system integrates histology molecular information. Again, uh, we said the integrated uh, <coughs> diagnosis, uh, the CNS tumors, this was the first solid tumors to do this. Our, our MDS confirms improved uh, 2016 WHO classification system for diffuse gliomas. Uh, the MDS clusters themselves contain copy number signatures, and we use those copy number signatures to derive these copy number subtypes. Okay. 
got to hit myself. Okay. And the, uh, if we look at the, the populations of glioblastoma, it's either the large, what we think of as uh, the, the general public, either the TCJ or GGN data sets, and then look at things that are more um, clinical, <clears throat> clinically driven, either by uh, surgery uh, for uh, surgical uh, resection and recurrence, or uh, inclusion into uh, clinical trials, at least in the elderly ARP trial, for the uh, use of a, va a vastin. And then uh, a little bit about some of the various copy number schemes, like the, the, those three major studies I talked about. And these are emerging ways to provide objective evidence for uh, molecular grading, right, which is, the WHO has been so kind of gray about. Um, and we, we still struggle with, right, grade two, grade three astrocytomas. What does it mean for IDH wild type? What does it mean for IDH mutant mutations? And um, I think that uh, copy number, at least uh, in a simplistic way, at least maybe with the CDK and 2A that we showed that goes across the three uh, studies, that that may be a way to risk stratify beyond our current uh, histological grading system. And just want to uh, take the time to acknowledge uh, my department who uh, pays me, uh, Fred Hutch. Uh, Eric Holland has uh, been my senior mentor on all, a lot of this stuff and a, a, a great resource and a, a fantastic person to work with and people associated with the STTR and the people in his lab. Uh, the STTR, or Seattle Translational Tumor Research, which has given me uh, funding for a, a bit of this work. And then the German Gilman Network, uh, Marco Vella and uh, Guido Reifenberger uh, were the main players and then uh, Rob Robinon who contributed the, um, the recurrent uh, data set from uh, Columbia University. Anyway, I thank you for your attention.